Welcome back, everybody. In their seats promptly, even one minute before the appointed start time. I am impressed. It happens that way in college all the time, right? You professors in the room. <clears throat> so uh, this session is titled 2017, A Tipping Point for Regulations for Investors. Uh, I'm Skip Schweiss. I'm with TD Ameritrade. I have two roles there. I oversee our retirement plan servicing platform, and I'm also uh, involved in advocacy work for our uh, investment advisor servicing business, a role I've been in for seven years, not quite as long as one of our panelists, Barb Roper, who is Director of Investor Protection for the Consumer Federation of America, a role she has held for 31 years, and a fierce advocate and winner of our Tamar Frankel Award in 2017. That is the first panelist I will introduce. Barb is a fellow Coloradan and has a son at my alma mater. Go Buffaloes. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce Cheryl Holland, founder and owner and president of Abacus Planning in Columbia, South Carolina, a uh, firm that's been in existence for almost 20 years in March, right? Yeah, yeah. Did a little bit of homework. Uh, the personal, closest personal connection I could find to Cheryl is that uh, I have a daughter who goes to school in Columbia, South Carolina. So. Uh, a fine town. So we go, go Gamecocks. Go Gamecocks. <laughs> or as they say there, go Cox, but that's college kids. Um, next, I will introduce to my immediate right Phyllis Borzi, former Assistant Secretary of the Department of Labor and Head of the Employee Benefit Security, Security Administration in the Obama Administration. Phyllis's father once told her, in your life, pick one hill to die on. And late in her government career, Phyllis picked that hill. And as I remarked last night at dinner, the hill is still standing and Phyllis is still standing. So um, hopefully you don't have to die on that hill. My but, staff made me correct that, to pick the hill you choose to fight on right. for exactly <laughs> that reason. I don't know if I want to commit my life to this. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, Mercer and I are friends, not close friends, but we've crossed paths numerous times. I told someone at the break that uh, I gave them a warning. I'm going to embarrass Mercer in, in my introduction of him. I, I didn't warn him of this, as you can tell by his facial expression. <laughs> and this person said, well, that you guys after that are either going to be closer or you're going to be not as close. But Mercer is professor of law at the University of Mississippi, a.k.a. Ole Miss. I once introduced him as being from Mississippi State, and I received a quick and harsh rebuttal. Uh, that's not the same thing as Ole Miss. He's also president and founder of Fund Democracy, former assistant chief counsel at the SEC. And I, I was doing a little homework in preparing to introduce him, and I went on this site called Rate My Professors, and uh, where students can go in and rate their professors. I don't know, Arthur or Tamara, if you've done this or looked yourselves up. Uh, voluntary, I can tell you as a former professor. It is voluntary? It is not. It is voluntary. not voluntary. Um, professor Bullard is very highly rated by his students as a professor. In fact, one of the, uh, you know, when, when you, we give a, uh, a review or rating on a hotel or, or some experience online, we title the review. One of the reviews was titled Amazing Lectures. That's pretty impressive. Now, optionally, when you fill out a, uh, a review on your professor, you can, also, uh, you can also indicate whether you think the professor is hot or not. I don't know if this relates to the intensity of the lectures or exactly what, but Professor Bullard is, in fact, rated as hot in his profile. So congratulations. You're not even turning red. Uh, I got tenure. That's how I got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it, it appears I was not successful in embarrassing him. So uh, the way we've structured this is uh, each of our panelists will share a few minutes on uh, a particular aspect of this tipping point question, and then uh, we'll have a few minutes for, for your observations and questions at the end. So be preparing those. And Phyllis, we're going to start with you and that hill that you chose to fight on. So... You know, for the six plus years that we worked on this rule, um, the question, the taunt we heard wasn't really a question. 
framed as a question, not really a question. We heard from the opponents of the rule is, this is a problem in ser search of a solution. This is a solution in search of a problem. What is the problem? So I've spent a long time thinking about what is the problem. And the problem is that everybody needs advice. And I'm the first to admit, even though I'm a so-called expert, that all of us need advice. And we need advice that's objective, that's timely, that's understandable, that's individualized, and which we know we can rely on because the person giving us advice is in a relationship of trust. And so we know, we know in our gut that that person is gonna act in our best interest. And that's the problem, that we also know that in the current world of advice, there are um, conflicts of interest that taint advice. This isn't a question of good people, bad people, whatever. It's a, it's a question of a system, an institutionalized system of advice giving in which the incentives are all wrong. Somebody asked a question about aligning consumer interests with the advisor's interest. That was the guiding principle of what we were trying to do because that's what's the problem, that, that we don't have a system in which the interests of the advisors are aligned with their customers. And so that's what we tried to do it, do, because we understood that there was this system, mostly hidden, but even if disclosed, not well understood by consumers, of third party payments that reward advisors for giving, for, for recommending certain kinds of products. And the effect of these conflicts is harm to advisors. It was really hard for us to quantify the harm under the Administrative Procedures Act and under the rules that the Office of Management and Budget um, operates by the executive orders. Uh, they will not clear a regulation. Regulations don't get, you know, it's not like I sat home one night you know, and said, hey, why don't we Last do this reg? And hand. I yeah. went in and I said to my staff, okay, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that. And three weeks later, we had a regulation and we got it out on the street. That doesn't happen. It takes years for these regulations to be uh, promulgated. And that's because the rigorous analysis you have to do to define the problem, to, uh, you have to define the problem, you have to be able to prove to the people at OMB and the rest of the relevant agencies, that the problem is caused by a market failure and that the way to fix this problem, this market failure, is there are a variety of ways. Here are some of the ways you could do it. And here's the way we chose to do it after extensive public input and comment. And the way we chose to do it doesn't have to be the all-time best way, but it has to be a way that's reasonably designed to achieve the goal in a way that is effective and efficient, and you get brownie points, bonus points, if the regulatory structure you come up with addresses the market failure by stimulating innovation in the market so that you have the market correcting itself within some parameters. So that's the standard that we had to operate under. Somebody said we, somebody told me last week when I gave a speech on this topic that we got, I guess we were slow learners because it took us six plus years to do this. No, the problem is you've got to develop the factual, legal, economic record in order to make those findings in order to get something through the government. So it wasn't so much that President Barack Obama himself on that cold February day at the AARP said, you people finish that rule. That isn't enough um, and that's why by the way, it's gonna be so difficult for the opponents of the rule to completely dismantle it. Because to dismantle it, you have to go through the same procedure. And so far, I've seen none of that discipline in anything that's happened. So that's what we were trying to do. The problem is finding, somebody said this earlier, the, the problem is in order to get advice, you've gotta have somebody that you trust. And how do you know who to trust? That's the problem. One of the most frightening statistics that we came across in the, in the research that we did was that um, you know, a very small number of people actually seek advice. It's something in the neighborhood of less than 25% of all individuals actually seek financial advice. And of that small number of individuals, 
60% get their advice from friends and family. I don't know about you, I don't want to rely on my friends and family, but I do trust them a lot more. And so what we see is what, if you go through um, the arbitration awards on the FINRA website and you listen to the plaintiff's lawyers, who are the people that typically people trust in which their trust is misplaced? They're often people that you would expect to be trusted. They're, they're friends and family, they're people that you know because your kids go to school with their kids, you go to the same church, you um, are involved in the same social organizations, yeah. you play tennis with them, you play golf with them if you're upper middle class, you play street ball, stick ball with them in the streets if you're not. So be, those are bases to trust people for lots of different things, like that old uh, trick, you know, that the old icebreaker trick that people used to use where somebody, you, you have to trust that the person will catch you as you go backwards. Well, maybe that's fine, but giving you financial advice to allow you to live your golden years, and I'm in my golden years, in, you know, with adequate retirement income. These, these are not the criteria you need to get to have somebody you trust. And what's fascinating, again, if you look at the research, is that most people think that the legal standard that, standard that applies to people who give them advice is that they are fiduciaries. They, they probably don't know the word fiduciary, or I think one of the big contributions as a former English major in college, one of the big contributions to the dialogue is now people know what a, a lot more people know what a fiduciary is than anything else. But it's not so much that they're fiduciaries, it's not so much that they are fiduciaries, but they do think that the people who give the advice are required somehow by law to act in their best interest. And they're shocked and horrified to discover that's not the case. And, and that's why one of our goals, in addition to aligning the interests of consumer and advice, advice giver and advice recipient, um, was to level the playing field. So as somebody last night said, we don't have just real fiduciaries and faux fiduciaries, um, so that everybody starts at the same baseline, a best interest fiduciary standard. This is a very uh, easy interest. You know, one of the things people ask, asked us at the OMB to look at is how tough a barrier to entry this, this uh, profession, using the term loosely, because we want it all to be a profession, but for some people it isn't. Um, you know, what are the barriers to entry? And my answer is always, they're so low, they're almost non-existent. Um, yes, if you want to be an RIA, you have to be a, you know, you have to be a registered advisor. If you want to sell insurance, you have to be licensed, etc. But anybody can set out a shingle that says, I want to give you advice. Business cards, I mean, it, I get business cards all the time from people with, a, a, an alphabet soup of initials after them, what do they mean? Maybe they mean nothing, who knows? But certainly the average consumer can't tell. Um, there's a very interesting report that was done in, I think it was 2012, by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau on titles. And they discovered that there were 57 commonly used titles that people who purported to be experts in giving advice used. So what's the consumer to do? This, is, this was one of the driving forces, and the more we got into it, uh, the more important we thought this project was. You know, I'm, I started my life as a pension lawyer for the last 20, 30 years. I moved into the health area. Um, but once a pension lawyer, always a pension lawyer. But I work with ERISA plans in, for most of my life. Um, but it's, I actually think the problem is much worse in the retail market, in the IRA marketplace. Because at least in an ERISA plan, you have by law an interposed fiduciary. Somebody who by law is a fiduciary and has to have the best interest uh, and work solely in the interest of plan participants and for their exclusive benefit. In the IRA marketplace, as one of the people who now is one of the big opponents of the rule said at the first hearing we had in 2000, nine about this. He described the IRA marketplace as the wild, wild west. I wish he would revert back to his original assessment rather than how he made money starting 15 different uh, organizations to oppose the rule. And now he has a different view. But um, 
So there's lots of reasons that we did this. Um, and people said to us, well, disclosure is enough. I think we had a little bit of a flavor of this this, this morning. The fact is, you can disclose all you want. People don't understand it. People don't even read it. Um, they don't understand it. They don't read it. They ignore it if they do. But the most important question, I think, is something in in Arthur's discussion with Tamar that we that we heard, which is, what do they do with the information when they get it? You can have the most transparent amount of disclosure, and if you don't know what to do with it, it's not going to work. Um, there's a very interesting paper that we rely, academic paper that we relied on our, in, econo in our economic analysis um, that we thought there were a couple of interesting ones, but there was one that I always talk about. And this is one in which they measured um, disclosure. And they if somebody discloses a conflict to you, what do you as a consumer do? Well, first of all, some of the people thought that the people who made these disclosures were actually more honest and more trustworthy because they didn't realize they were required by the <clears throat> SEC to make this disclosure. They thought, this, this is wonderful. The person is voluntarily telling us they have a conflict. And I might say the disclosure is the typical disclosure, which is um, my compensation may vary based on your choices. What does that tell anybody about anything? Um, but the, bad, the other bad policy result is if somebody, the, the consumers they, they talked to, they interviewed in this survey, basically said, if somebody tells me that, well, then I'm actually more likely than not to take their advice because I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want them to think I think they're bad people or untruthful. And they've told me, so they're not going to harm me anymore. On the flip side, on the advisor's side, as Tamar said, as in this inter in the interview we just heard, um, they feel more empowered, the advisor, who has a conflict, who discloses it. So what they found in this, in this academic paper is they, the advisors with conflicts who disclosed them actually acted more radically on the, con on the conflict than they did if they hadn't disclosed it. Neither of these are good policy results. So what, but the important bottom line here is what does the customer do with that information? So in devising the fiduciary rule that we finalized, that we put together, um, we had to create some regulatory guardrails uh, because you can't rely only on disclosure. You had to do some other things. And um, so what we did is we made it clear. We didn't change the definition of what your duties are if you are a fiduciary under ERISA. What we did do is clarify um, what advice or recommendation is. And we expanded the category of people who claim they aren't giving advice. There's a major... Um, financial services firm that whose signs you see around the city all the time um, that actually told the people at the White House that under no circumstances did they ever give financial advice that everything they did even one-on-one -on -one, if I was sitting in Mercer's kitchen trying to tell him what products he should buy but that was all education it wasn't advice <laughs> so therefore it didn't trigger any fiduciary duty um, we wanted to try to make it clear that that wasn't right. So we expanded the category of people who were considered to be fiduciaries. We were very, very specific about what constitutes a recommendation. And we did it in fairly straightforward, easy terms. I know I'm over time. I'll stop in a second. And that is to say, if this is sort of um, the the standard that was used in the Affordable Care Act for whether you go, whether it's an emergency or not, whether you can get reimbursed. It's, would the person to whom you're giving this advice or this recommendation or this, this suggestion think that you were, it, that it was a call to action, that you were actually suggesting that they do something or not do something? Now, we didn't make this up from whole cloth. It happens to be the FINRA standard for a definition of a recommendation. We thought that would minimize the opposition because, after all, all the people subject to SEC regulation that are selling securities, they already are supposed to do this. But you would have thought that Western civilization, as we know it, would collapse if we use that definition. Um, 
But the most important thing that we did in the retail space, in the IRA space, is to require that, require a couple of things, that the advisor acknowledge in writing fiduciary status so that you wouldn't be arguing about whether the person was a fiduciary at all. They had to adopt, um, and they had to acknowledge this through a written contract. They had to develop policies and procedures that were designed to align those consumer interests with the advisor interest. And, um, and, and then we had some other things, but I think the contract, the policies and procedures, the acknowledgement of fiduciary status, and clarifying the definition of what it is is a recommendation versus education are the most important things in the rule. And that's very simply what we did. Thank you, Phyllis. Claire. Pick up that ball and run with it, Mercer. <laughs> oh, first I rate my professor. Did they say which is my best side? <laughs> they didn't go into that level of detail. There were a few dimensions uh, okay, they probably. rated you on, but not. I'll have to ask my students. There was just a uh, pepper, like a red pepper showing right. you're hot. Just one red it's, pepper? You, that's, that's the highest. That's the highest you can So, get. well, uh, I, I do want to begin, Phyllis, by I, I have to question the six years you say it took to do the analysis because, you know, the administrations be able to make decisions about this rule overnight. Before, so, before they even were. I don't know what took you so long. But, yeah. Uh, so the, the point Phyllis made that is really most interesting about this is kind of the economic world in which broker-dealer compensation lives. And if you look at it just from an economic point of view, um, mutual fund, for example, uh, that, that structure of compensation really makes no sense. And uh, we have sort of three broad types of products that are sold by broker-dealers. They sell um, stocks and are paid a commission. Uh, and as I think we all know that when you call your broker to buy a stock, they don't tell you that the commission on buying Dell is going to be three times as much as buying something else, like Facebook. Um, and in that case, you have a somewhat efficient process where the recommendation is not going to affect what they're paid. Um, you also have markups and markdowns for fixed income products, which again is, is relatively regulated, albeit not necessarily efficient, where we have FINRA imposing limits on how much more you can charge above the price of the uh, bond in your, in your uh, inventory. Um, and then we have mutual funds where uh, you can recommend a stock fund and there can be substantial differences in what you are going to get paid for recommending what are virtually identical types of instruments. And not only that, even though you are responsible for recommending an allocation among, let's say, cash, fixed income, short-term fixed income, maybe corporate bonds, stocks, you can get paid more than three times as much for recommending a higher allocation to stocks as for other products. Um, in addition to that, we have compensation structures where uh, what are known as payout grids would provide for a broker who is on the brink of increasing the percentage of the commission that they will get from the mutual fund sale um, from, let's say, 40 to 50 percent uh, is applied retroactively. So what that means is if you are about to hit a million dollars in commissions and you are on the brink and someone walks in and makes a $10,000 purchase, uh, what will happen is you will get 50% of the commission on that $10,000 as opposed to the 40% you would have gotten previously, but you'll also trigger another 10% on all of the preceding million dollars in commissions. So that $10,000 sale gets you a $100,000 commission which I think the DOL properly recognized creates somewhat of a perverse incentive. Um, so you have these, these scenarios that from an economic point of view make absolutely no sense. It's an incredibly inefficient process. It naturally leads to what are probably nationally distorted asset allocations. And if you wonder why we may have some volatility in the market, there may be a systemic tendency to recommend 80-20 allocations when if brokers weren't paid a lot more for the 80, which goes into stocks, they might recommend 60. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see in the longer term repercussions of this rulemaking, whether there's actually a measurable difference in asset allocations, um, not to mention savings by investors. So um, I don't want to take too much time, but I thought I'd give you an idea of some of the product changes that are already resulting from what I view is already 90% of the rule having gone into effect, and there really being no signs of it changing. So first of all, the variability I talked about in commissions, 
um, is being addressed by having, for example, uh, clean shares, where funds are offering shares that, depending on how you define clean, will essentially strip out of the services provided by the fund and the fund sponsor just about everything except for money management. And what that will leave them doing, of course, is they will still have to be the ones who are the transfer agents keeping track of the Merrill Lynch account. But no longer, for example, will we have the fund paying Merrill Lynch to keep track of the 3 million Merrill Lynch customers that are in the fund. Instead, instead Merrill Lynch will say, this is what I charged you for keeping track of your accounts. And in addition to that, instead of having commissions that will not only vary across stock funds and short-term bond funds, within the same fund complex, we will have you decide, broker-dealer, what you are going to charge your customers so that just like when you buy Dell or IBM, you can pay Schwab's $4.75 or maybe you can pay Merrill's $99.99. But it will be the price, as it should be, that Merrill or another broker-dealer sets itself. Um, so another version of this are T-shares, where the industry has, interestingly, all happened to decide on 2.5% being an appropriate commission. Certainly raises interesting antitrust problems, but I'm sure it's merely coincidental that all of a sudden they are able to agree that that flat commission amount plus a 25 basis point 12B1 fee um, is perfectly doable and is a way to level commissions so you've substantially removed that type of conflict of interest when the broker is making recommendations. And what's most remarkable about this is the industry consistently lobbied that we would not be able to charge commissions at all after the DOL rule went into effect. But as soon as it became imminent, they were already developing new commission structures that are obviously quite workable. Um, on the payout grid front, I expect we are already seeing a lot of those ratcheted structures going away so that you don't retroactively get a huge, what might be called a windfall from a tiny transaction, but instead have probably no retroactivity and then very, very small steps so that the impact of moving up is not going to create the level of perverse incentives that I think the DOL would not like. Um, on the other hand, but there's no question that you can pay more for producing more, and that's just an intrinsic aspect of making brokers competitive in their business. So that is completely appropriate. Um, so those are a couple of examples of you know, what we've already seen changing in the industry, and I expect that to you know, continue to have repercussions depending on how the one last issue plays out that I was going to mention. Um, and that is this arbitration question that I raised earlier. And as many of you know, the litigation of issues between clients and broker dealers occurs only in arbitration, mandatory arbit arbitration, which is provided for in virtually all broker dealer contracts. And in that world where opinions are not written, we really have no idea other than professors who are interested in this topic, bugging arbitration lawyers every time they meet one as to what goes on and why things happen. Uh, and Without knowing that, and also given that recently FINRA has been much more amenable to allowing all public arbitration panels, which you might describe as defined as people who know nothing about the securities business, um, and not having lawyers on the panel, um, and not writing opinions, the idea that they are asked to then opine on what a fiduciary duty is and when one exists, uh, seems to me like a deep, dark hole that is bad for investors, but even worse for a compliance officer, because you're the one who's on the hook when you lose the case for not having anticipated the kinds of procedures that you should have had in place in order to prevent it. Um, so that, I was talking to Phyllis earlier. That, to me, is why, of the things that are still on the table for potential repeal, the policies and procedures are the key, because for for op broker dealers, ultimately, that's the papering of the file that then drives so much else. So, um, if we really see if we see that survive to a significant extent over the long term, maybe not in this administration, but over the long term, um, I think you are going to see implementation of real sort of fiduciary standards in the broker dealer compliance world. Now, that being said, the most common claim in arbitration is already a fiduciary duty breach something that is virtually never comes up in the debate about the DOL rule. So the DOL rule is not about whether that's going to be a claim and whether it sometimes wins. It's really about whether going in, are you going to be able to start off the discussion in arbitration saying, 
they are a fiduciary. We're not going to litigate whether there's a relationship of trust and confidence. And are they going to be able to say, well, it's in the law here. I know you've never heard of ERISA, but it says they're a fiduciary, non-public, know-nothing non-lawyer panel. Or maybe there'll be a contract, which would be better, because you can put a piece of paper in front of them that says we're a fiduciary. That, I think anyone will understand. But either way, they're going to go into that arbitration unless the administration reverses the definition of fiduciary, which is really what this rule has always been about. Yeah. And what apparently the administration tried to get reversed early on, but wasn't able to get that done. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out in arbitration. That will be interesting. And then the last point is, all this, uh, all this effort going into repealing the ban on taking class actions to court as opposed to working through arbitration. Well, FINRA has always had a prohibition against banning class actions from arbitration. I don't get the industry's focus on that because they're already subject to that ban unless they think it's that the, the insurance industry that's driving that right one. because they don't because they, they're well, not subject right, to if they're that. not subject to it. Although more and more of those insurance products are being sold by broker dealers. So they're, they're seeing the broker dealer community eat their lunch anyway. And, but there's also the prospect um, that, you know, the DOJ has a new position, which is that the FINRA is not allowed to dictate terms of arbitration because of the Supreme federal Court. standard on arbitration. So we'll see whether FINRA rolls on that, in which case we will see the FINRA ban go away, and then we'll see a real difference. But as a practical matter, broker dealers don't get sued in class actions. Because of, the, because of the class certification problem. If you look at the history, all the class actions are against insurance companies, and they get sued. A lot more commonality among the documents and sales processes they use, they use scripts, so this is really maybe more vulnerability of the insurance field. It really is not an issue for broker-dealers. I just don't get you know, SIFMA's obsession. So with that, Great. I'll hand it off. So fiduciary duty at a tipping point, right? So Phyllis, gets us up to the top of the hill, the top of the precipice, with passing a rule that says, not only are we gonna say brokers have a fiduciary duty, they have to act in their customer's best interest, but we're going to make them change the practices that encourage and reward conduct that's not in the customer's best interest. To your point, regulation only works when we align the incentives. So, or, Regulation works best. Regulation works easiest. When we rely, align the incentives, we're not working against this headwind of, yeah, legally I have to act in your best interest, but, you know, to Mercer's point, I'm getting paid three or 10 or 20 times as much to sell you this, and somehow I can get comfortable with it. And Mercer has explained, you know, when Phyllis, is, Phyllis said when they were doing that, it was unworkable. No one could do what DOL was telling them they had to do. It was simply not possible for brokers to change their business in that way. And then as Mercer points out, the rule passes and they already started very seriously down the road of changing their businesses so that they would comply with the rule. And fortunately, there were some firms who took it very seriously and were quite thoughtful about how you design a new broker-dealer business model that works under this standard. So it's, you know, it's clean shares. And the thing about clean shares is you can equalize compensation across everything the broker sells. It's not just within mutual funds or it's not just within a fund complex. It can be for everything. This is what I charge you for the services that I provide and I have no incentive to favor one product over another. And guess what? Then they don't have an incentive to act against your best interests. So here we are teetering at the tip tipping point, we've got the regulation, we've got businesses making the changes that show that they could really make this happen. The problem with tipping points is you can tip either way, depending on which way the wind is blowing. And I am, as people will, who know me will find no surprise here, far less optimistic about Mercer, about the survivability of this standard because there are so many different ways the industry has of attacking it right now. They don't have to go through the DOL process and reach a finding that says it was a bad rule. They can go to the SEC and they can go to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and they can get them to adopt a weak and watered down rule, one that relies exclusively on disclosure, and then say, and because we want a harmonized standard, 
anyone who's subject to that standard, and by the way, subject to, not in compliance with, but anyone who's subject to that standard now satisfies the DOL rule. And so DOL rule has been, it could still sit there on the books, and yet for everyone who's providing the services out there, it may as well not exist. And so where we find ourselves now is SEC Chairman Jay Clayton, under enormous pr pressure from the industry, right, to step in and rescue them from this horrendous DOL rule, um, has said, said just yesterday in testimony that this is a priority for him personally to act in this area. He's put out last summer a request for input, had you know, all the questions that I personally have been answering now for 20 years, wrote my first comment letter on this topic in 1999. Um, you know, are investors confused? Damn straight they're confused. You can have a financial advisor who's not an advisor who says he acts in your best interest but doesn't legally have to, markets his services as retirement and planning and investment planning, but as far as the regulations go, is merely a salesperson, as they argue very vehemently in court. Investors aren't just confused, they're actively deceived under the existing regulatory structure. He asks, do conflicts of interest matter? Damn straight they matter. You know, people respond to financial incentives, and if you can make 10 or 12 or even three times as much recommending this as recommending something else, you're going to find a way to get comfortable with that. It affects conduct. We can prove that with the academic literature. DOL proved that in their, their regulatory impact analysis. And then the question, what should we do about it? And in that process, SIFMA, the Trade Association for Broker-Dealers, and ICI, the Trade Association for Mutual Funds, and some of their allies have come forward with a proposal that is truly bold in its cynicism. You know, what they said is, we're all for a harmonized standard. It is very important that we have a harmonized standard because it is really confusing for investors if the standards isn't harmonized. Never mind that Congress intentionally set a higher standard under RISA. And then they don't even propose a uniform standard under the securities laws. So they don't want the standard that currently applies to investment advisors to apply to brokers. They want the banking regulators to write their own standard and the insurance regulators to write their own standard. And even if the language ended up roughly the same, we know it would be interpreted and enforced differently. So in the name of uniformity, they have proposed complete lack of uniformity. And then they've said, we are all for a best interest standard. As long as you don't mean that we actually have to seek to do what's best for our customers. If we can just tell you in some boilerplate disclosures the 25 different reasons we're probably not going to ask in your best interest, we're all good, right? And by the way, those disclosures under their proposal are entirely within the discretion of the broker to decide the content, the format, the timing, and the delivery mechanism, including access equals delivery, which means it's on the internet someplace. Good luck finding it. So the entire weight of investor protection in their standard is based on disclosure, and, but they say, hey, you know, we've got a duty of loyalty and a duty of care, and we've defined it entirely in terms of our existing suitability standard. And there is not a single thing beyond these added disclosures that we have to do under that standard that isn't governed by the existing standard. So their play here is to say, this is our compromise. We're supporting a standard. It's all about having the SEC step in and act. And if they win, you know, if, if Jay Clayton, Chairman Clayton, gives them what they want, they won't have just, you know, they won't have just left us with the status quo. They will have won the right to say they're subject to a best interest standard. They're fiduciaries too now. And, you Whatever know. Whatever that you, means. Right, whatever that means. And 
we won't even be able to educate around it as we do now. You know, we have some clear educational method messages that we can do now. So that's one threat. And the other one is in court, right? So we have a legal challenge in Texas, one at the district court level in one of the most wonderful court decisions ever written. It's beautiful. But had, you know, a somewhat antagonistic <laughs> oral arguments at the appeals court level. And there is, I think, a lot of concern that we could lose that, that challenge. And the Department of Justice could stop defending the rule. Um, and then you'd have to see you know, if there's an alternative way to keep to defending the rule. But so, so and the rule, depending on what the decision says, could be vacated entirely. Or, so that's another threat. The thing about that is, I am not convinced that the broker dealers and the insurance people have thought through clearly the implications of winning a court case that says we are just salespeople. We do not give advice. We engage in arm's length commercial sales transactions. And if they win that case, can the SEC still allow them to call themselves financial advisors? market themselves as if advice is the primary service that they offer, and <coughs> sales are merely incidental. And that will be a test of the SEC's willingness to stand for investors or continue to protect the broker-dealer business model at the expense of investors. So in that environment, what happens within the profession becomes extraordinarily important. Right? We, the rule is a threat. You know, we have, you know, we, we are at a moment where the ability to solve this problem through regulation is under attack and could be threatened. And what the profession does to embrace or distance themselves from the fiduciary standard matters. And in that context, the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards ha is engaged in a pro process, now it was mentioned earlier, where they have recently, they put together a commission, I happen to be on it, um, that looks at reviewing um, their standard of conduct for those who have the CFP marks, which is a voluntary professional certification, and with an eye toward reviewing those standards, they put, revising those standards. They put them out for public comment, so I'm not breaking the seal of confidentiality. The biggest change that they've proposed is to say, that going forward, CFPs would be fiduciaries with regard to all their advice, not just when they're engaged formally in financial planning, as is currently the case. And they've defined advice so broadly that it picks up sales recommendations, you know, advice to a client. There has to be a client relationship, but beyond that, it's a very broad definition of advice. And it is causing considerable heartburn in this, among the same groups who oppose the DOL rule so strenuously and are trying to water down the SEC standards that they could now be up against the most respected credential in the profession saying, if you want to use our marks, and 78,000 some of them do, then you're going to have to live under this standard of care. And that you know, so they get to make a choice, right? If the, assuming the board still has to approve it, assuming the board approves it and it goes into effect, there's been some posturing. Well, we just won't let our advisors use their CFP credentials. Personally, I'm kind of looking forward to the investor education campaign that says XYZ firm is so opposed to acting in its customer's best interest that they just decertified all their CFPs. Are you sure you want to work with them? Because I don't think they have your back. So tipping point, yeah, there are a lot of factors that could push us either way. Um, we will keep fighting regardless. Thank you. So Cheryl, as a, as a boots on the ground practitioner, what do you make of all this? So Barbara, thank you. I can't wait for your speech. <laughs> that was excellent. Um, so I think I know two people in the room well, so just a brief story to give a bit of perspective on what I might be talking about. Um, we all have family stories about ourselves as children, 
And one of my favorite family stories that my family repeats about me was when I was eight, um, I was selling Girl Scout cookies. I came from a family of fairly modest means, and I needed to sell 400 boxes of Girl Scout cookies to go to stay over camp, and that was very important to me. And I was about 10 short, which goes back to the grid, and my grandmother said to me, I'll buy those 10 boxes from you. And I said, but Mimi, you don't need those 10 boxes. So I've been a fiduciary <laughs> from a very young age. Um, you can also imagine I was not much fun at high school parties. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to take a point from what Barbara said and, and shout out a gratitude to the CFP board for finally taking the step to say, if you're a certified financial planner, then you are a fiduciary. Um, we. I think everyone in this room probably recognizes that financial advice is an industry, not a profession. But we are moving towards becoming a profession, and this will allow us, in my opinion, to move even more rapidly to being a profession. We couldn't be a profession for a number of reasons. We didn't have evidence-based methodologies for delivering advice. How, you know, We didn't have all the background and information to provide good technical expertise. That has changed over the past 20 years, and now we're developing an ethical code and standards of conduct that befit any profession. So first of all, thank you, Barbara, and the board for doing that. Um, I will say a couple of points from my perspective that might fill to this room after hearing what goes on in the broker-dealer world. I'd like to talk a little bit about the registered investment advisor and where I think we need further movement and discussion. And I'm just going to pick two points of view, two points. One of those are disclosure of fees and talk a bit about that. And Phyllis, I understand that people may not understand disclosures, but I want to talk a little more deeply how repetition and may help with that and standards around that. And then I want to talk about conflicts of interest and how they're handled in the Code of Ethics. So first of all, um, under the Code of Ethics, you will require to disclose how you charge your fees. I feel a little bit like that train has left the station you're fee only, you're not fee only. All those things are important to disclose how, but I think it's more important for you as the consumer or you as my client to understand exactly what you're paying. And I mean to detail that, put it in writing, and all the other fees that are associated with executing on your financial life. If you think about the places that you don't trust somebody, how many of us feel comfortable buying a car because we don't trust the process of understanding exactly what we're paying. That might be say, go on certain vacations, you feel a little queasy because you get there and it's extra for this and extra for that. You don't really understand what you're paying and therefore you don't have an advisory relationship. You don't have a trusted advisory fiduciary relationship with those people. So I think until the details of what you're paying, your clients deserve that in my opinion. And just to get, I understand, Phyllis, there may not be understanding. I agree with that. The first time I go over fees with client or any advisor in our firm does, you can tell that person is looking at you as if you were a glazed ham. They glaze over. I've also learned that the head nodding means I don't have a clue what you're saying. So, but what I have learned, and the, and the other problem is we as professional investment advisors are not comfortable talking about our fees. Mm -hmm. So it's ironic that our lives are all about advising on money, but to sit down and say, you're paying me $28,000 a year, you're paying me 5,000 a year, and here's all the underlying costs, is not natural to us as it should be. But what I have found, the second or third year, people kind of go, I don't really get line three, or the format doesn't make any sense to me, or you're talking gibberish. And so with repetition, I have found a comfort in opening that box and saying, you need to get better at doing this. The form needs to be better. You need to find a different visual way to tell me this. So I do think moving in that direction might bring better understanding because education as well as disclosure. I didn't want to, I don't no. want to be misleading. Disclosure is important uh, I, part And of I the heard process. that, Phil. So it I was just, just saying. just by itself does I work. totally agree with that. So I just think that's highly critical and I'm, proud of the Institute for making that part of the best practices of what we do. I think the conflicts of interest standards in the Code of Ethics is very interesting because it's fairly light. I would say it's disclosure of conflicts, L-I-T-E, but it's important that we start there. And let me tell you why. This, the profession end of the industry has almost no conversation around conflicts of interest. We are so fixated on what all the other guys are doing. Well, we're not 
transaction based. We're not grid payout based. Here's a, we're, so therefore, what conflicts do we have? That I, I think we're blind. And let me give you just a handful of simple examples. In our firm in the past month, probably, new clients come in. Big transaction from a sell of a business. They own three homes. Do they pay off their mortgages or not? I make more money if they don't. But they're very risky and they want to take that. Different facts would lead to different outcomes for every client, but we don't talk about that particular conflict. Client calls up, spouse has Alzheimer's, but still in the conversation, spouse calls up and says, I want you not to tell, I want you to tell a therapeutic lie in the meeting. Doctors on board with that. We've done trading around Alzheimer's. Do we tell the therapeutic lie? Do we not bring up the issue? What is the conflicts of interest around that? So we are just, we were talking earlier, trust relationships, the trustee, the income beneficiary, the remainder beneficiary, who's bringing these conflicts of interest to the table? Client wants to get divorced. Can you represent both? There's no right or wrong, but we as a profession are not even talking and discussing with one another real life conflict of interest that we need to learn more about to be better equipped to give good advice to our clients. So I don't think it goes far enough, but I do think it will shine a light in one of the many dark corners in sort of the lead of becoming a profession. And that's just as important as what's going on in the pig and the pine farm part of it, because where we go is where the profession is going over time. So I, I'm a grateful, hope those two things get evolved over time among many other things, but I'm more optimistic than Barbara. Everyone is. <laughs> but I'm grateful she's pessimistic and in the trenches over that. So there are I have a couple of different reactions to that. One, it's what the DOL did, right? They did a they did a rule that applies to everybody regardless of product or background, or your bank, or your insurance, your securities. Every retirement account. Yeah. For every retirement account. And then we have all of this balkanization outside of that. There is a basic question is, do you think retirement accounts deserve a higher level of protection because we have chosen as a matter of public policy to give them tax advantages? So you can make, you can make a case that says, no, we shouldn't have a uniform standard. We should have a higher standard as ERISA sets for retirement accounts because we've deemed them of significance, national significance. But if you're going to go to a uniform standard, then we need to go, we need to harmonize up. You know, so uniformity really in the name of uniformity holds no attraction to me because mm -hmm. I think it would be pretty easy to get a uniformly bad standard adopted. I think I could, that's the one thing I could get through Congress in a heartbeat, right? But it would, so it's, so the question is, are you willing and is it appropriate to harmonize everyone up to this higher standard that is the fiduciary standard? And when, in our last comment letter to the SEC, we sort of walked through this process because the other argument is, let's recreate the functional distinction between brokers as sellers and investment advisors as advisors. And you sort of walk through, what does that look like? They have to call themselves salespeople. They have to call their services arm's length commercial sales transactions. They have to advertise them as sales services and not as financial advising or retirement planning or investment planning. And they have to clearly disclose the limitations of those services. And if you do that, there will be no market for them. Because when we wrote the securities laws, you needed a professional to help you do a transaction. You needed a license professional to affect the securities transaction. You can do it today with a click of the mouse. You go to a broker for advice. It's the only reason average, it's the 99% of the reason average investors are in a broker's office is for advice. So we need to start recognizing as they have in their marketing materials that if that's the service that they're pushing to the public, that's the way we need to regulate them. And in that sense, harmonizing them up to an advisory standard, I think, is essential. Yeah, I don't know how many lawyers <coughs> there are in, a room, in the room, but Too many. In, in law school, that's what I was thinking. In law school, you know, you take conflicts of laws. And the way you reconcile conflicting laws is you top up 
if you don't want to violate one or the other of the legal standards, then you act in accordance with the highest legal standard. You eliminate all confusion. You eliminate liability for failure to observe this standard or that standard. I think, Barb, you're absolutely right. And when people, when I'm on panels with people or, or, or in meetings with people who talk about investor confusion, I always say to them, there's a, a simple you know, way to eliminate investor confusion. Now, they're talking about confusion between, they want you to think that investors are more confused in having to, a distinction between the standard of care that's applicable when they get retirement advice and financial planning with, for their taxable versus non-taxable advice, as opposed to the standard today where you have no idea what the standard is. You don't even know, as you say, what to ask. Cheryl, well, I think you had a comment, and then we better close it off to keep the program on time. That might doesn't answer that question, but there's something else that's going on. That's demography. Young men and women graduating from college, the large life insurance and other organizations are having a hard time replacing their 50, 60-year-old crowd of salesmen. They want to be in the fiduciary world. And it's going to be a fight for talent. And so one other trend that we need to take into consideration is not just what's going on in the regulatory world and the demand from the educated consumer, but what that new group of people, their entrepreneurial spirit. So I just think that may have an equal impact, not right away, but over the next 10, 20 years that will surprise us too. So I, that's something that plays into the standards. May not have to, we might have freedom and rather than dictionary going forward because of that. We're out of time. Good. We only had time for one question, but had some great discussion around it. I'm sure these folks will be around for a cocktail in about half an hour, and we can ask them some questions one-on-one. -on -one. But thank you. Thanks.